Okay, thank you very much <clears throat> for the opportunity to speak. I uh, hope this is big enough. And um, so actually, the, the, all right, let me just calibrate this correctly. So the talk I want to give actually is very much an IPAM uh, lecture because it, it begins with a certain multi-matrix model that's due to Paul Zinjustan and, um, and John Bernard Zubair, which I first learned about at an IPAM workshop in 2020 um, when Paul asked me a question about topological expansion for this model. And that was the last conference that I went to before, <coughs> before COVID hit. So lots of time to think about Paul's question. And, uh, and now I know how to answer it at this next IPAM workshop that I'm attending. And, and actually, it turns out that the answer to this question is almost entirely in the realm of algebraic combinatorics and, and integrable probability. And the way to answer it is by transforming this original uh, random matrix model into a model of random Young diagrams. So if random matrices are not your, your thing, they will soon um, uh, fade into the background. And this dual uh, model of random Young diagrams is, is very much related to Schur measure, which I think is probably familiar to most people um, in this audience. And these dual models are kind of like a, a, a hypergeometric deformation of Schur measure, which I'll describe um, in some detail. OK, so first of all, the definition of this matrix model that Paul, that Paul told me about. OK, so this is. Uh, it's kind of a, it's sort of a statistical mechanics type of construction. So what I'll call a hypergeometric model, hypergeometric matrix model, it's got a state space and the state space is compact. In fact, it's a product of, of some compact groups. That, let me just get out a little cursor thing. Uh, yeah. Okay, so it's a product of unitary groups. So you have some, some prescribed number Q of unitary groups of prescribed ranks N1 through NQ. And the states in this model are going to be, you know, vectors of length NQ consisting of unitary matrices of these prescribed ranks. And then the next ingredient you need is an energy functional, which is going to assign some, you know, potential energy to a particular state in, in the system. And the energy is defined by summing from K equals 1 to Q uh, the trace of, of just a, a monomial or a Laurent monomial in, 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 uh, in the coordinates of these states, which is separated by prescribed uh, complex rectangular uh, matrices, external fields they're often called. And so this is just like, you know, the coefficients of this energy function are these prescribed rectangular matrices AK and BK. And um, this could in general be a complex number. So this is, you know, not necessarily kind of a, a, a compatible with the usual formalism of statistical mechanics. It's a bit of a, a, um, an abstraction of it. And the partition function corresponding to this information is the integral of this uh, Gibbs type density over all states um, against the exponential of the energy of a given state. And Z is the inverse temperature parameter, which I'll just allow to be a complex number. And so the K plus one is mod Q? Yes, the K plus one is mod Q. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, that's sharp, exactly, all right, okay. And so um, if this inverse temperature parameter Z is actually real and the energy E is a real valued function on, on your product of groups, then this is actually like a bona fide uh, Gibbs measure on Q-tuples of unitary matrices of these prescribed ranks N1 through NQ. And uh, you know, it's the, the usual thing where like this is the Boltzmann factor and the partition function is the integral over the density of states and basically tells you what the, the definition of the whole system is. And there are two natural questions probably at this point, which is why would I, this, so this is what's called a, a multi-matrix model, right? So if you randomly sample from this measure, you get a Q-tuple of, of random unitary matrices of prescribed sizes. And why would you refer to this multi-matrix model as hypergeometric is a question which I'll answer very soon. Um, but first, why would you care about this model at all? I mean, the definition seems to be quite particular. Um, so what, what is its significance? And so here's an example when Q equals one. So this is a unitary one matrix model. And one reason to justify this, <clears throat> this definition is that it has a name, so it's probably people have thought about it before. When Q equals one, it's called the Itzig and Zubair partition function. And this is a really important special function in random matrix theory. It, it occurs in many different ways. And perhaps the easiest way to explain the prevalence of this particular matrix integral in random matrices is that if I take any n by n random Hermitian matrix, which is, has a unitarily invariant distribution, then if I look at the, the Fourier transform of this matrix, which completely encodes this distribution, I would like to know how does that Fourier transform determine the distribution 
of the eigenvalues of the matrix? And the answer is that the, the uh, eigenvalue distribution of this, of this random unitary matrix is determined by taking an expectation um, just against the eigenvalue law of this kernel. Okay, so this kernel, it's like, um, you know, your random variable is here, and this is the argument of the transform, and this is like a replacement for the Fourier transform for n by n random matrices, and in fact, if n was equal to 1, and the matrix was just equal to its eigenvalue, this would actually be the Fourier transform of just a scalar random variable. Okay, so that's one way to uh, maybe justify interest in this. And if, you, if that's still not good enough, there's a Q equals 2 example that I could also point to, which I'll you know, state in less, um, in less uh, detail. But when Q equals 2, you have a double integral over unitary matrices. And you know, when you have two unitary matrices, it usually has something to do with a singular value decomposition in linear algebra. And indeed, it's exactly the same situation with the Q equals 2 case of this, of this hierarchy of, of uh, Paul and John Bernard. So this integral <coughs> gives you a kernel which describes the joint distribution of singular values in a random rectangular matrix in terms of the characteristic function of that matrix. Okay, so if you want to know this in more detail, uh, just ask me and I can tell you, and it's, it's not too complicated. Okay. There's a type on the second last name. There, there's, uh, this is not how you spell this? Oh, okay, sorry. I never met Karpolevich, so. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, yeah. Um, Okay, so, so just to sum up, the reason to study this, this uh, statistical mechanics system, perhaps, is that um, the Fourier analysis of eigen and singular values in, in random matrix theory is really basically the imaginary statistical mechanics of, um, of these hypergeometric matrix models, where your coupling Z is an imaginary number. And in fact, for arbitrary values of the coupling in arbitrary external fields, so everything is complex, it doesn't matter, um, this model is integrable in the sense that it can be analyzed in, in great detail um, using basically tools that come from algebraic combinatorics together with a little bit of complex analysis. And uh, so the, while the model itself might look maybe unfamiliar to a combinatorial audience, the, the kinds of things that are going to happen to you next are going to be um, very familiar. Okay. And so a sign that um, this is something that is an integrable model, and maybe some justification for calling it a, a hypergeometric matrix model, is that there's an exact formula for the partition function, which was found by uh, Paul Zinjastan and Jean-Bernard Zubert. So, you know, just by Fubini, we can assume that the ranks of these matrices are sorted in, let's say, weakly decreasing order. It doesn't matter how you arrange them. And I'll just call n the smallest rank. And it's a fact that this partition function, this integral over, over the density of states, is actually equal to a very nice ratio of determinants. Okay, so this is a formula found by, um, by, by Paul and Jean Bernard, which says that this complicated looking integral is, uh, is, is you know, you have two Vandermonds determinants of, in AJ and BJ, where the a, little a's and little b's are the products of the external field matrices which enter this model. So these are gonna be n by n matrices, if you arrange them in this order. Okay, so these are the, the complex eigenvalues of these things. And then in the, in, the, um, in the numerator, you have something which is not a Vandermann, but it's phi of z to the q a i b j. So you have products, mixing products of the two eigenvalues of these, of these external fields, uh, where phi is, is a hypergeometric function. Okay, so it's this very explicit um, entire function of one complex variable z. And so in particular, just as an easy example, if your q is equal to one, and we were looking at this Itzig and Zubair case again, you would get a very famous formula for the determinant um, which evaluates the Itzig and Zubair integral, and that determinant is in fact pretty much the definition of the Schur functions. So in other words, when Q equals one, the system is giving you a, a, an integral representation of, of the Schur polynomials. Okay, so that's, um, this is the theorem of, of Paul and Jean Bernard. And what Paul's question is, is when the ranks of the matrices which you're integrating over grow large, can you actually approximate the free energy of this statistical mechanical system? So what that means is the log of the partition function, and there's kind of an expected form that the, the free energy of any high dimensional matrix model should assume, it's called the topological expansion, um, and what should happen is that the logarithm of z as n goes to infinity 
should be approximated by a series that looks like sum from g equals zero to infinity uh, n to the two minus two g, where this is an Euler characteristic. These powers are, are, this is like, you know, the Euler characteristic or maybe the negative Euler characteristic of a genus g surface. And fg should be some function of the parameters defining the model, okay, which is holomorphic in some particular region and is somehow related to, uh, to combinatorial invariants of compact uh, Riemann surfaces of, of genus G, connected, connected, smooth connected curves over, you know, projective over C. And, um, and this is kind of, it's known to be the case for various types of matrix models, um, in particular when you integrate over um, ensembles which consist of multiple self-adjoint random matrices, this type of expansion is known to hold and it's very much um, investigated even today. Um, there's still lots we don't know. But when you're integrating over unitary matrices, there's actually very little known, in fact. And it's not really clear when you integrate over self-adjoint matrices against the background Gaussian measure, there's kind of, a, a kind of an easy reason to see why something like this should be the case just has to do with the combinatorics of the Gaussian distribution and its relation to pairings. Um, but it's not so for unitary matrices. And what the mechanism behind an expansion of this kind would be um, is far from obvious. And so, um, so Paul asked me whether this kind of approximation actually would hold for this model. And I, I assume the reason he asked me why it would, because he knew that in 2020 I knew how to do this for Q equals one. And so this was a very um, beneficial uh, pre-COVID conversation for me. <laughs> and so for 2022, I, I knew how to do it for Q equals two. And then after a couple more years, sort of thinking about it off and on and realizing that I was kind of being a little bit stupid, uh, and now I know how to solve this for all Q. So I can tell you the, the answer to his question and it works out um, rather nicely. Okay, and so the way to get started is to think about where did Paul's determinantal evaluation come from. And it comes from an infinite series representation of this partition function z. And this series involves quite familiar objects, all right? So it says that you can basically forget about this matrix integral, just you can, if it's not to your taste, just forget about it entirely. And what you're really looking at is a power series, okay, in the coupling constant z, and then a sum over Schur polynomials, okay? So this, this is an infinite series, and z is marking the degree of the infinite series. And then I have a finite sum inside, which is over Young diagrams with d cells and, and at most n rows, right? And the Schur polynomials in the eigenvalues of these external matrix fields. And so these are all the parameters that determine the system. And then, you know, um, there's a coefficient. And the coefficient is sort of the complicated part. The coefficient is one over n1, you know, subscript lambda, nq subscript lambda. And what does that mean? Um, this is a, a polynomial function uh, of lambda evaluated at the ranks of the matrices in the model. And this polynomial function of lambda is called the characteristic polynomial of a Young diagram. That's not a completely standard name. Um, it's usually called the content polynomial of a Young diagram. And, and that's how you'll find it defined, let's say, in McDonald's textbook. How are these small a's related to the matrices which you had previously? The small a's. The small a's are the eigenvalues of this product. Okay, and the small b's are the eigenvalues of this product. So although you have many matrices, but somehow only product matters. Indeed, and it really is because of this kind of cyclic orientation of this energy functional. Okay, um, but yes, I mean, this is kind of a non-trivial uh, statement to write down. It's, it's like, this is called character expansion of matrix integrals in the physics literature. And, you know, in, in Paul and John Brown's paper, they didn't actually write this down, but I have no doubt that they, they knew it um, because they're experts in, in using this technique. And you can kind of see where this determinantal formula comes from, right? So the Schur polynomials are determinants and you just do some kind of Cauchy-Binet sort of thing and you can sum this up and you'll get the formula that I showed you um, in the previous uh, slides. And basically what I claim, yep, Sorry, I think I'm a little confused. The matrices A and B, you said they're the product of the AIs and the BIs, yep. and then those, what constraints are on the AIs and BIs, or are those just what they're, define the model? That's what defines the model. So these A's, the capital A's and capital B's are just any input matrices that you want. And then I take this product, and it actually depends only on the product of these prescribed matrices, and in fact, only on their eigenvalues. 
But the A's are rectangular, right? They're the like A's are rectangular. N, N, I yeah, by yeah. N. that's so correct, it's... right? So the, the dimension of the A's and the B's is rectangular so that you can glue, glue together these two unitary matrices of possibly different ranks, giving you something, you know, this should be a K by K square complex matrix. Okay? Correct. Okay, so what's an example of this characteristic polynomial of a, of a Young diagram, getting maybe into much more familiar territory? One, it's very easy, to, you know, um, to define. So you just think about an infinite um, tuplets matrix whose, whose uh, entries are j minus i, just as i and j range over all integers. And you get this, like, you know, I didn't write the minus signs below the main diagonal, but these are, these are negative mi minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, and these are plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, and so on. And you just take your Young diagram and you just make it into a jagged corner of this matrix, and you just take, you know, product of x plus the content um, for each of these numbers, and this gives you like a polynomial that looks something like this in this form. And this is usually called the content polynomial of a Young diagram, but it really does make sense in many different ways. It's actually quite beneficial to think of these numbers inside this Young diagram as, as eigenvalues and the lengths of the diagonals to be the multiplicities of those eigenvalues. Okay, it's a very useful um, description. And what you can see from the character expansion of this partition function is that it actually belongs to a, a much bigger and older class of special functions, which is not so well understood, but, but quite important. And this class of special functions goes back to, um, to Alan James in 1964, who defined it kind of building on, on work of earlier people, you know, Bachner in, in, in harmonic analysis and um, some of his students. And so it's usually called a hypergeometric function of two matrix arguments. So that's long. I'll just call it a hypergeometric kernel. So it's easy to remember there are two arguments. Okay, so a hypergeometric kernel on, on n by n complex matrices is a function of the form, you know, kpq. So there are p upper parameters and q lower parameters, right? And these are the arguments of the hypergeometric function. There's this coupling parameter z, which you don't really need. It could be absorbed into either the a's or the b's, but it's convenient to keep it around. It's a nice kind of marker of homogeneity. And then I'm summing over Young diagrams with the most n rows, okay, where I, in n variables. And what I have is an arbitrary product of, uh, of, um, of characteristic polynomials of Young diagrams divided by another arbitrary product of characteristic polynomials of Young diagrams evaluated at some specified complex numbers x1 through xp, y1 through yq. And there's a little bit of a constraint that I would like to put on these parameters, which is that, you know, definitely it should not be the case that the y's are integers less than n. Otherwise, you'd be eventually dividing by zero for some Young diagrams here. And uh, so that's not an optional constraint, but I'll, you know, you need that. Um, and, and I'll also put it on the x's. And what that means is that this rules out the case that this sum is actually a, a multivariate polynomial. It's actually a non-terminating um, power series in all these variables. Okay? And um, so, you know, why would a thing like this be called hypergeometric? It's because if your rank parameter n is equal to 1, this is literally a hypergeometric series like in the sense of, you know, Euler and Gauss and people like that, okay, from a long time ago. So if n is equal to 1, then this kpq z a b, the a and the b are just, just complex numbers, and what I get is uh, FPQ of Z times A times B, where this is just the classical hypergeometric series, and this is the usual Pockhammer symbol, okay? Um, and, you know, uh, so this is a multivariate generalization of classical hypergeometric series, which involves our favorite objects, the Schur polynomials, and they're, you know, among many um, competing multivariate generalizations of classical hypergeometric functions, this might be the one that is um, most profitable to study. Slightly controversial statement, depending on, <clears throat> but it's, a, it's anyway, it's a good option, <laughs> okay? So uh, <clears throat> here's an easy example. So the Cauchy kernel, this higher rank hypergeometric series, like this is the case where it's a hypergeometric series, which isn't hyper, right? It's actually the geometric series. So this is a multivariate version of the geometric series, which as you all know, is given by the, um, by the Cauchy identity. Right? So this sum, you know, if I take my upper, I only have one upper parameter and I set it equal to n, the rank, then this ratio cancels out. It's just one. 
And I'm just adding up the sum of all the Schur polynomials in two sets of variables. And this is the product as ij um, goes from 1 to n of 1 minus zi, uh, 1, 1 minus zai times pj. So that's probably pretty familiar. And you know, so that's why these, these kernels, these, these functions of two matrix arguments are called hypergeometric um, kernels. And so, you know, like I said, this is an infinite series in many variables, in fact, in 2n plus 1 complex variables. And the question is, you know, when does it actually converge? And this is quite easily answered. Let's just get it out of the way. You can just think about these things. Well, actually, don't think about them formally. But for now, maybe you just ease into thinking about them as analytic functions. And it's quite, quite tame how this works. Um, so if the number of upper parameters is at most the number of lower parameters, then this is actually an entire function of 2n plus 1 complex variables. You can do whatever you want to it. Converges everywhere. Now, if p is equal to q plus 1, you see you have, you have q plus 1 things down here and p things up here. So you can, like, as long as this balances out, this is going to still have reasonable convergence properties. And in fact, it converges on like a, a poly disk that you can think about as like the higher dimensional analog of, uh, of just the open disk in the complex plane. What you need is that the modulus of z times the maximum modulus of a's of the a's and the maximum modulus of the b's is less than one, um, and you have you know uniform on compact convergence on this on this domain. And if p is bigger than q plus one, you shouldn't think about that as anything other than a formal series because it only converges at the origin. What if you terminate it? Yeah, if you terminate it, it's a polynomial, so that's okay. <laughs> All right, so that's why I ruled that out. <laughs> okay. Um, and this is exactly the classification of just hypergeometric series in one variable as well. And in fact, the way you prove this is just by comparison with the univariate case. It's quite an easy argument, in fact. Okay. Um, and actually, it turns out that statisticians, so James was a statistician. He defined these multivariate hypergeometric functions in a statistical setting. And statisticians have been studying this like for a long time now, and they know a lot, in fact. But what they know is they know how to do everything with n arbitrary but fixed. So it turns out that this theorem of Paul and, and Jean Bernard is actually a special case of a more general theorem which evaluates every hypergeometric hyper -geometric matrix kernel <clears throat> as, a, as a determinant, has a determinant formula. And the entries of that determinant are just controlled by the n equals 1 classical hypergeometric series um, attached to this kernel, which it generalizes. And uh, so this, this implies this Zinjistan Zubera formula, but the way they prove it is exactly the same. Um, so, you know, um, this, is, this is a result that's known to, to many, it's known in representation theory too. And what statisticians didn't figure out, and this is exactly the question that Paul was asking, is how do you approximate this sum, this convergent power series, when the number n of variables is going to infinity. Okay, so that's equivalent to the question that he asked about matrix integrals once you know this character expansion. And so how do, you, how do you approximate this when the number of variables goes to infinity? And this is very different from the type of approximations that you would do with a classical univariate hypergeometric series where you send some parameter values to something or something else and you look for an integral representation, you do some steepest descent or something like that. So it's quite different, and this is called the high dimensional regime, as everybody probably knows. Um, you are trying to find an approximation um, in a multivariate space whose dimension is going to infinity. Uh, so it's a different kind of approximation problem. And that's what they were stuck on. Um, and that's what Paul knew would be interesting. And so, so the goal is to uh, approximate these hypergeometric kernels um, um, in the high dimensional regime. You know, how do you understand how this thing behaves as a function of 2n plus 1 complex variables when the number of variables is extremely large? And so we've seen a couple possibilities for approaching this, um, this problem now. Um, one is that you could use, try to use these determinantal formulas. And that's kind of not so easy, right? Because these are determinants where the size of the determinants are going to infinity, and their entries are controlled by an arbitrary univariate hypergeometric function where you're plugging in like elements of the matrix which could take arbitrary complex values. And so, you know, uh, it doesn't seem that this is a viable approach. There's another possibility, which is just forget that we had this character expansion and just try to estimate these multi-matrix integrals from first principles, you know, work with those as the primary objects. 
And this can to some extent be done using techniques from random matrix theory if you insist that all these parameters are real. Okay, if all these parameters are real, your, your matrix integral will not be oscillatory and you can do some more sophisticated version of the Laplace method. And in fact, in that, in that regime, I do have um, some results together with Elise Guillenet, which tell you something <clears throat> about integrals of this kind using, um, using Schwinger-Dyson equations and some other stuff. And the problem with that is I told you that we really want the imaginary statistical mechanics of, these, of this system, okay? I really want this coupling Z to be equal to an imaginary number so that I can view it as a Fourier transform. And so I need to somehow work with these oscillatory integrals. And that doesn't seem to work on, on the random matrix side. So option three is work directly with these hypergeometric matrix kernels via their Schur function expansion, okay? So you just forget about everything else and you have this infinite series um, in Schur polynomials, and you want to estimate it as the number of variables goes to infinity in all, so yeah, okay. I mean, so, um, you know, let me tell you how you can think about this in a more structured way. So this is just something that came out of this computation of a matrix integral. And, you know, maybe you don't really care about these matrix integrals. And what, what is really the, um, what are these functions kind of more intrinsically? And I think really the right way, this is a small remark at the level of an observation, but I really think this is the right way to think about it. There are autocorrelations of the characteristic polynomial of a, of a random Young diagram whose, distri whose distribution is the Schur measure, okay? So what I mean by that is like this background, okay, is the Schur measure defined by, by a Kunkov. If this was not here, if this factor was not here, you would just be getting the Cauchy summation formula. And what you're doing is you're taking an expectation of this observable. And this observable is, an, is a, 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 you know, it's products and ratios of the characteristic polynomial of your Young diagram evaluated at given points, um, at given data points. And this is a type of average that is studied very intensively in random matrix theory, usually um, in the case where you are averaging against, uh, let's just say, Haar measure on the unitary group or maybe you have a Gaussian random matrix and you want to know about autocorrelations of the characteristic polynomial um, of that matrix ensemble. And in particular, in the case of Haar measure, these, correla these autocorrelations are, are very much studied by people in analytic number theory in connection with the kind of general idea that um, eigenvalues of, of Haar unitary random matrices should be a good model for the distribution of the, of the zeta zeros on the critical line. And the way they test that hypothesis is by looking at the large N asymptotics of autocorrelations of this kind with not characteristic polynomials of Young diagrams, but characteristic polynomials of matrices. Okay, and this is a useful picture to keep in mind because it kind of tells you how to treat this thing. So when you study autocorrelations of the characteristic polynomial of a random matrix, you renormalize. You do something that's, that's called the random matrix scaling, which is that the evaluations of the characteristic polynomial you want to use, you, you say that those should vary as your rank parameter n varies, and they are like proportional to, they're linearly proportional to n, to the rank parameter. That's the, that's the random matrix scaling. So I make a change of variables where xi is equal to ui inverse times n, and yi is equal to uh, vi inverse times n, where the u's and the v's are just some non-zero complex numbers. And what I get, this is what my, my content product, this, this product of characteristic polynomials looks like. And now I just factor out like all the linear growth from each of these terms, okay? You factor that all out. And what you get is just a, a scalar, right? This is the product of the V's divided by the U's. And then you get an order, which is easy to predict. How many N's are there upstairs? There are P. How many N's are there downstairs? There are Q plus one. Okay, this is the product over the cells of lambda. So you get number exponent is the, is the size of the Young diagram. And then you just, you know, you get this weight, this product of, uh, uh, over the contents of your Young diagram, which is like, you know, calling out to you to, for some kind of perturbative expansion. And that's what we'll actually do. Okay. Um, and so how do you set this up uh, a little more formally? So let me say that what I'll call a hypergeometric potential, you know, it's just a way to make sure that this problem is defined uniformly for all values of n. Okay, so a hypergeometric potential 
is a univariate rational function which looks like this. So v of zeta, v is often used for potential. V, it's a function of one complex variable. It's a you know, rational function um, with uh, the polynomial upstairs is, has uh, um, constant term one and same for the polynomial downstairs. And you can add whatever parameters you want for its coefficients, you know, almost. Right, so p should be less than or equal to q plus one, so that we have the type of convergence that I was telling you about previously. And also, what you want is you want these upper and lower parameters, your u's and your v's, to be banned from the um, from I guess the the uh, negative real numbers together with zero, and um, positive numbers larger than one. And this is just like the continuum limit of these constraints that your x's and y's shouldn't be. Um, integers less than n for all values of n after you perform this renormalization procedure. Okay? And this condition guarantees that this product, um, v, content of box over n, is well defined and positive for all uh, Young diagrams with the most n rows. You know, like why is that? Because, you know, I'm saying this is positive on minus one to infinity, and if I have a Young diagram with at most n rows, the smallest content, like all its contents are larger than minus n. So, okay, so that's a number that's bigger than minus one. Okay. And so a hypergeometric partition function then is something that you can define to be a multivariate analytic function um, of this form KNV, which is like basically the same thing as these hypergeometric matrix kernels after this renormalization procedure. And the difference is that the, these parameters, the u's and the v's are set. Okay, you just prescribe them and they, they work for all values of n. Whereas if you were dealing with n arbitrary but fixed, you would have to keep like redefining your parameters to accommodate this constraint that they shouldn't be um, integers less than n. So this is like a stable way to formulate this thing. And this defines a probability measure on Young diagrams with at most n rows. So it's for all n, so it's an ensemble of random Young diagrams. Okay, and this measure might be complex valued. And in fact, because we said that v was positive um, on, on 1 to infinity, this measure is going to be a legitimate positive measure whenever Schur measure is complex, uh, is positive, is positive. Okay, so for whatever, whatever specialization of these variables you pick that would make Schur measure positive, this too will be a positive normalizable model of random Young diagrams. And, um, and this is what I call the, the, uh, the hypergeometric model of, of Paul's uh, random multi unitary multimatrix model. Okay, in the case where v is just the reciprocal of a polynomial, this is giving you a dual model which has the same partition function, but instead of its states being a q-tuple of random unitary matrices, it's just a diagram, just a random Young diagram. Okay, and um, and so really our question is, can we? Discover the mechanism why there would be a topological expansion for these ensembles of random Young diagrams. And uh, okay, so this is what I'm what I'm writing here. And um, so in order to answer like a more general version of Paul's initial question, we're looking for this, right? We want to know that the logarithm of one of these hypergeometric partition functions as n goes to infinity <coughs> has asymptotics of this form where the FGVs are like generating functions for genus G invariance of something, you know, determined by whatever the parameters and the potential are. And, um, and just, to, you know, to be clear, we want to do this for all values of these parameters. So this is like, you know, this result, these asymptotics should hold uniformly for all choices of Z and A's and B's in some parameter domain. So none of this stuff about choosing clever specializations or anything like that. Can't do that. All right. Um, yeah, here's the potential. <clears throat> and, and, you know, it's kind of, what's hard about this, maybe a priori, is that it looks like if I want to estimate this thing as n goes to infinity, I would first need to know how to estimate each term in the sum, which would mean that I would need to know how to estimate sure polynomials as the number of variables goes to infinity. And that's, you know, you shouldn't try to do that because as we already discussed, one of these hypergeometric functions is itself a representation of a sure polynomial in a certain exponential change of variables. So you'd be going in a circle if you tried to estimate sure polynomials and then um, use that information to estimate, estimate this. So what you have to do is you have to get rid of the sure polynomials. You want to replace them by some other system of symmetric functions 
whose asymptotic behavior as the number of variables goes to infinity is, is transparent. And you know what? <laughs> That's the power sums, okay? So power sums are just not mysterious at all, right? And, uh, and, and so what you do is you just use Schur-Weil Schur duality in this form, just the expansion of the Schur polynomials in the Newton power sums. Um, and that will allow you to replace the Schur polynomials here with power sums. Um, but you're going to pay a cost, right? The price that you can't, you can't just eliminate the complexity entirely. All you can do is shift it into something that hopefully is more manageable. And the, the price you pay is that you're introducing the characters of the symmetric group here, which are themselves not so easy to understand. Okay, so these are actually the central characters of the symmetric group. All right, uh, that's not so bad. The central characters of the symmetric group. So what do I mean by that? This is uh, omega alpha lambda is the eigenvalue of a conjugacy class C alpha in the symmetric group, you know, viewed as an element of the group algebra. Take the formal sum of, uh, you know, uh, I guess all permutations of cycle type alpha. And just by Schur's lemma, it acts as a scalar operator in, in any irreducible representation. And this is the eigenvalue of that scalar operator. <laughs> OK, all right. So basically, um, this is the operation you know, spelled out for you. So this is the initial structure that I would like to estimate. Right? I want to estimate this as the number n of variables goes to infinity. And I replace my Schur polynomials with power sums. Okay, for both of them, both instances of this Schur polynomial. So I get a new series, but it's actually the same series. <laughs> I get a series z to the d over d factorial, sum over alpha, beta, or Young diagrams with d cells, p alpha in the a's, p beta in the b's, and some new coefficients, which are often in, in you know, it's a term borrowed from related contexts, could be called the string coefficients um, of this partition function. And they look like this, right? So yes, we got rid of the Schur polynomials, but this product that was already kind of a little intimidating, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, now the, the price we paid is that we have to sum um, the values of this product over all Young diagrams with D cells against a weight that emerges from when you um, um, switch from Schur polynomials to power sums, which is just the Plancherelle weight for the, for the symmetric group, which is good. Uh, and then I have two characters that I also have to contend with. And so now the question, you know, we've shifted everything into just understanding these numerical quantities, which are totally finite, right? So this is just a finite sum over Young diagrams with D cells in at most n rows. And I somehow need to understand how this thing behaves as n goes to infinity, but it's just a finite sum. Okay, so even though we got characters of the symmetric group here, one could argue that this is an improvement even a priori, and actually this works uh, very well. So um, like I was saying, the, the problem is that these string coefficients are, are like they seem complicated. And, but you can deal with them in a useful way. And it's a kind of a two-step process. So you want to use symmetric function theory to write down a perturbative expansion of this product. And then you want to use the representation theory of the symmetric groups to understand what the coefficients of this perturbative expansion are by actually doing this Plancherel average over whatever you get. And um, so here's a very simple example for doing this. Suppose our potential was equal to V of zeta equals one, constant potential equal to one. Then what would I have? We would recover the Cauchy identity, right? So this product would just be ones. And I'm doing some kind of a proof of the Cauchy identity, which involves orthogonality of the characters of the symmetric group, right? I switch to power sums, and I get this Plancherel expectation over alphas and betas. And these, you know, I mean, the Plancherel measure is like the push forward of, of uniform measure on the, on the symmetric group um, just under the Fourier transform. And this is exactly the, the weight that you get. This is just like the L2 isometry of the, of the Fourier transform. So this is exactly the same thing as the scalar product of the conjugacy class C alpha with C beta, you know, which is going to be equal to zero um, if alpha and beta are not the same. And if they are, you get the cardinality of the conjugacy class which leaves me with this sum. And you see, this is a sum of multiplicative functions, right? P, the power sums are multiplicative in the Young diagram that indexes them. So I can just write it as a sum over permutations, p type of pi in the a's, p type of pi in the b's. And you know, how do you deal with an exponential um, uh, series like this? You go to chapter five of Richard Stanley's EC2, and you realize that this is an instance of the exponential formula. 
okay? Which tells you that in fact, this, this sum, there's no potential, this sum is just equal to the exponential of sum from d equals one to infinity, z to the d over d, the, the power sums, um, just pure power sums. And so this is like um, the exponential function formula in permutation form, I believe it would be called in Stanley. And this tells you that like in this trivial case, this expansion that Paul is asking for is actually true for any arbitrary n. That's another way to think about this. This is true for any n you want. You don't need asymptotics. And your genus zero term is just this you know, trivial function. And uh, fg is equal to zero for everything of, of higher genus. And now we have to somehow like replicate this argument with a potential here. Okay, so I'll show you how to do this in, in one um, non-trivial case. The potential will be v of zeta is one over one plus uh, v zeta times one plus zeta, where v is a, a parameter. And what will that parameter be? Let's just like, you know, take it from the top. How would everything look starting with the initial definition? This would correspond to this unitary two matrix model, which has this partition function. This is the berezin uh, which I don't know how to spell apparently, um, partition function. This is the character expansion of that matrix integral, okay? And this is the string expansion of that matrix integral. When I switch from um, characters of un to just Newton power sums, okay? And my parameter v is equal to the, uh, the smaller rank divided by the bigger rank, so it's a, a positive number less than or equal to one, um, which is the inverse aspect ratio of a, of a rectangular matrix, right? If you go by a TV, the aspect ratio is like the large, larger to the smaller or something. Um, okay, so, and we need to understand this finite sum. So this is a, like a very concrete thing. And we have to deal with this product. And so it's kind of clear how you would expand out, it looks tricky, but how do you expand out this, uh, this product this is just the generating function for complete symmetric polynomials, really, right? I mean, it's just a product of, of ge geometric series. And um, so what you get, this is sum from r equals zero to infinity, minus one to the r over n to the r, just the ordinary convolution of the complete symmetric polynomials with themselves. So sum from s equals zero to r, this parameter v to the a s, h s lambda, h r minus s lambda, um, where HR lambda is the complete symmetric function evaluated on the multi-set of contents of this Young diagram lambda. And so now the question becomes, what do you know about symmetric functions evaluated on uh, contents of Young diagrams? And, um, and this has a kind of a polarizing um, effect on, a, on an algebraic combinatorics audience. So, you know, probably most of us learned representation theory of the symmetric groups from Sagan, which is an excellent book and, you know, I highly recommend you keep reading it. Um, but it doesn't cover this. Uh, and if you were felt, you know, maybe Sagan met all your needs, but if you felt a little bit unfulfilled, you might know that there's a, another construction of the irreducible representations of the symmetric group um, due to Akunkov and Vershik, which is actually all about evaluating <laughs> symmetric functions on contents of Young diagrams. So, you know, don't, don't throw away your Sagan, but buy another book too. And uh, the, the way this, this works, the whole, the whole theory that Akunkov and Vershik built is based on UC's Murphy elements, which are like very simple um, elements in the group algebra of the symmetric group. There are these transposition sums. You know, JK is you sum over all swaps which interchange with something smaller than K. And these aren't central elements, but they do commute with each other. And in fact, they generate a maximal commutative subalgebra of the symmetric group algebra called the gelfand setlin subalgebra. Hopefully I spelled that right. I know there's several spellings of Sadlin. Okay. Um, and it, it's a theorem of UCs and Murphy. So we don't need the full power of the akunkov vershik theory, but it's a, great, it's a great way to look at things. We just need an older theorem of UCs and Murphy from 1980, which says that any symmetric polynomial in the UCs Murphy elements, even though these elements are not themselves central, lies in the center of the group algebra. And so that means that it acts as a scalar operator in, in any irreducible representation. And what is the eigenvalue of that scalar operator? You just substitute in the content alphabet of the representation into the symmetric polynomial that you are trying to take the uh, you know, homomorphic image of. So for example, if your symmetric polynomial is just H1, the sum of the UC's Murphy elements, 
This is the sum of all transpositions, and that acts in V lambda as just the sum of all contents of lambda, which was a formula already known to Frobenius. And this basically extends this Frobenius formula to whatever symmetric functions you want. It's a way to like manufacture elements of the group algebra of the symmetric group whose characters are very easy to compute. Okay. Okay. And so what we see now is that the Plancharel expectation that we want to evaluate is just, you know, by the uh, decomposition of the group algebra, it's equal to a product of a conjugacy class on one side, a product of another conjugacy class on another side, sandwiched by a product of two symmetric functions um, of some given deg total degree in the UC's Murphy elements. And, um, and so this expectation is the coefficient of the identity permutation when you expand out the central element just in the, in the basis of conjugacy classes. And so there's a great way to picture this, which looks like this. Okay, so this is the Cayley graph of the symmetric group S4 as generated by the conjugacy class of transpositions with a little bit more information. Um, and this information course is called the UC's Murphy labeling. And what I've done is I've labeled each edge um, with the uh, larger of the two numbers that is swapped um, in that transposition. You could also use the smaller number, it doesn't matter, just be consistent. So, you know, in S4, all, led, all edges are labeled either two, three, or four, okay? And what a, um, what a sum like this is, imagine, there's, imagine S was zero. So this was just C alpha, H, R, and the UC's Murphy elements, C beta. Just from the definition of the UC's Murphy elements, this would be the number of ways to walk from a conjugacy class C alpha in this graph to the conjugacy class C beta in this graph, which have the property that the labels of the edges you traverse form a weakly uh, increasing sequence. So you know you have like this particle that's moving on the Cayley graph of the symmetric group in, in a kind of non-Markovian way, in a self-interacting way, where once it crosses a bridge of value seven, it refuses to use bridges of lesser value from that time onward. And what we have here is just a convolution of two of these things sandwiched between two conjugacy classes. So what that means is the coefficient of the identity is counting two-legged monotone walks between conjugacy classes in, in, in the symmetric group. You know, you take some number s of steps that's monotone, and then you reset, and you take remaining r minus s monotone steps to get to your uh, target conjugacy class. And um, so what we get is actually a, a series, okay, almost done, get a series expansion um, of these string coefficients that we wanted, which is like very kind of combinatorially appealing in the sense that it's a generating function for these two-legged weakly monotone walks in the Cayley graph of the symmetric group where your aspect ratio r is a, an ordinary marker for the length of the walk. Okay, and this sum converges for all, as soon as n is large enough. And so that actually gives you this, this perturbative expansion of, of these string coefficients that we wanted. And, you know, you need one more thing to, to, uh, to weaponize this. And the last question, you know, the last polarizing question is, what do you know about factoring permutations into transpositions um, or taking walks on the Cayley graph of the symmetric group? This also is a somewhat divisive thing. So it depends on whether you're a Grassmannian person or a Hurwitzian person. <clears throat> and do you like moduli spaces of... of uh, of linear spaces, or do you prefer moduli spaces of, of curved objects like curves? And um, this does seem to be correlated with uh, um, adherence to Sagan in some way. Okay, and um, on this side of things, you really need to know about how to factor permutations into transpositions. If you want to, if you want to think about intersection theory and moduli spaces of curves, you need to know about Hurwitz numbers which count these decompositions. And the reason for that is um, there's a theorem of Hurwitz from 1891, um, which was sort of boosted to like a more relevant for our purposes theorem by Kunkov in 2000, which is that what's the, there's an enumerative geometry interpretation of walks on the Cayley graph of the symmetric group between two conjugacy classes. And the interpretation is that, you know, they count degree D branch covers of the Riemann sphere by some compact Riemann surface X whose branch locus consists of the north and the south pole, where you could have whatever ramification profile you wanted over those, those two points. Um, and over the rth roots of unity on the equator of the sphere, those are just simple branch points corresponding to transpositions. And the, the Hurwitz encoding, uh, or in this version of Akunkov, you know, it, it's, it's um, of, of such branch covers is just counting r-step walks from c alpha to c beta, c beta 
on the Cayley graph. And by the Riemann-Hurwitz formula, that number is zero unless the number of steps is 2g minus 2 plus the number of parts in alpha plus the number of parts in beta, where g is the genus of x, which could be negative if x is disconnected. But if you want to connect, count connected covers only, just count transitive walks, and that defines for you what are called the double Hurwitz numbers, um, and g must be non-negative. And so you get your theorem that you wanted. And the theorem is that the logarithm of this hypergeometric series with this potential here, <clears throat> you switch to string form and you get some new uh, um, coefficients, string coefficients that you need to calculate. And what the logarithm does is exactly make your previous enumeration problem into the connected version of that problem. And you get a genus expansion. Okay, so g equals zero to infinity the sum of these two-step monotone double Hurwitz numbers, two-leg monotone double Hurwitz numbers, um, over, all, over every genus. And the fact is that you can do this for any potential you want. Okay, so for any of these rational functions, you can make such an expansion. You'll get a more complicated convolution of symmetric polynomials and contents, but you can always calculate that by inverting the Fourier transform um, on the center of the group algebra of the symmetric group, which will give you combinatorial invariants that count certain branch covers um, with two uh, free points of, of ramification. And, okay. and so the, basically the, the answer to Paul's question is yes. Okay. So the answer to Paul's question is yes. Uh, there does exist a topological expansion um, of these unitary multi-matrix models. And the topological expansion is quite easy to understand at the end of the day when everything is said and done. Um, you can say what these combinatorial invariants are and what they have to do, uh, what their topological meaning is. And, um, and there's a lot more that you can do with this because, you know, remember that there's uh, this connection with random matrix theory and you can use these things as kernels. This helps you do Fourier analysis on random matrices. And, um, okay, and uh, so that's the, that's the answer to the question. I think I'll stop there because I'm already over time. <laughs>